Welcome back to our 71st episode of the Launcher Farm Show. Ryan of you, Jesse Zagorski with EXP Realty in San Diego. In this episode, Jesse and I talk about why you need to listen to your leads and how you build better relationships when you can master that skill set. Jesse also shares how you can use direct response marketing to generate more leads than you can handle. And we talk about what key things you need to do to ensure you convert leads at a high level as well as build long-term relationships. And Jesse shares a super easy way to ensure you create stability in your business by farming smaller areas and building real relationships that no big company or tech giant can compete with. And we talk about how you can learn to friend work instead of network to build better relationships and build more trust. Plus, a ton of other ideas you can use to grow your geographic farm. So be sure to check out this episode, like and subscribe, and enjoy the episode with Jesse. Welcome back to another episode of the Launcher Farm Show. I'm your host, Ryan Smith, and today we've got a great guest. It's Jesse Zagorski. He's a team leader with eXp. So Jesse, take a second. Tell us a bit about yourself and why you're here. Yeah, um, I'm here because I love your podcast. I love your energy that you bring to helping people uh, grow their business and launch farms. But uh, no, I'm here just because I'm a marketing nerd. I'm a sales nerd. I've been in real estate for, for 18 years. I've had a business partner who's been my mother for most of my career. So I'm, nice. I'm a mama's boy. I'm very, <laughs> I'm very, I'm very grateful. Right? I've uh, to work with her all, all these years. Uh-huh. And um, yeah, we've just, I've had been small teams, big teams. And I, I, I have a podcast myself and some other, you know, training things that we do. And I just wanted to come and chit chat and nerd out on real estate. Awesome. Yeah. I'm looking forward to diving in. I know for the viewers, if they don't know, I've been on your show a couple of times and done a couple of things with you as well. So it's awesome to collaborate and to share experiences. And I think that's part of the reason why I wanted to bring you on because you've got your own personal experience, plus the the experience from the people that you've had on the show and then the people you've been working with in, in your team and things like that. So it's, you have a wealth of experience from different avenues, which is really a great way to learn. Yeah, I'd almost say I have probably more experience from others than even myself at this point. I mean, even though I've been doing real estate for 18 years, so our podcast, it's the uh, Agent Power Huddle. It's actually, it's like a live sales huddle that any agent, any company can join in every day, yep. eight o'clock Pacific. And I've interviewed hundreds, if not, I don't know. I mean, we've done it for over you know a year and a half at this point. So I've interviewed hundreds and hundreds of people that do all sorts of farms and marketing and various items. And I get to see what works and what doesn't and what's a total dumpster fire and what's What's, what's a good thing to do. <laughs> exactly. And that's yeah. I, that's good point to that is I always say that sometimes it's also important to learn, not just learn what to do, but what not to do. And that's when I got started in the business, I started on a team and people say like, oh, it's great. You get to learn what to do. And I said, one of the most important things was seeing what not to do and saying, avoid this, do this. And by learning from other people, you can absolutely do that. So I want to go back to then your beginning, because obviously you said you worked with your mother. Was she in real estate before you then? Only for about a year. Okay. So I had a really interesting upbringing. I'm, a, I'm an only child. Do, do you have brothers and sisters? I don't yes. know, actually. Yeah. yeah, okay. So I'm an only child. Which How many brothers and sisters do you have? So I have two biological and my parents were foster parents. So I had foster kids that live with us as well. So I've got a, wow. a, a range of people. <laughs> oh, that's so cool. I right, will have to dig into that offline. All right. So <laughs> yeah. in, in, in terms of my own background as an only child, my parents were entrepreneurs. They always ran various small businesses my entire life. Like, they must have had 18, 19 different businesses. They had wow. three or four main ones, but like they were always starting things that someone works and didn't work. And so I grew up at the kitchen table, like just hearing these challenges with businesses and like brainstorming and masterminding with my parents since I was like five or six, which I thought was a totally normal thing for kids to do, by the way. It's, <laughs> yeah. it's, it's not, yeah. um, but, I, but I'm grateful for it. And so my mom and my dad, they sold off a business and they got into real estate in like 2001, okay. like the beginning of the internet of real estate. And my mom sold like 44 houses her first year in the business by herself. Wow. And was like, this is pretty cool. You should try this real estate thing, Jess. And I was working at, a, at MTV at the time. I was doing marketing for them. Nice. And I was like, yeah, it sounds like sounds good. Yeah, I'll get my license. And so I got my license, moved back and, and partnered up with my mom. And, and that was it. That's awesome. Yeah. And that's... Yeah that's cool that you had that experience. It wasn't like you said, it wasn't a whole lot of experience before her, but she obviously had some success and then you guys were able to merge that together. So what did that beginning first few years look like for the two of you as you started to work together? Cause I find for some people that can be a struggle those first couple of years. Oh yeah. So so my mom and I just lucked into a really nice compliment with each other's skill sets. I've always been obsessed with marketing and strategy and sales and that part of it. And my mom has a master's in computers. She is 
not a salesperson. Like the fact that she's, <laughs> the, seriously, the fact that she sold so many houses her first year in the business is the fact that she's just an incredibly hard worker and she's really smart. She's put her head down and like, if you ask her, how'd you sell so many homes your first year? She said, well, she worked for a company that did all the lead generation for her. Okay. So all she had to do was, it was called house rebate. It was like one of the very first discount commission companies that gave a third of the commission back to the client. This is in okay. 2001, 2001. So this is like, no one was doing stuff like this, right? And so yeah. she said, all I did was I picked up my phone and I called the leads they gave me from five <laughs> to eight o'clock every night. That's it. I'm like, yeah. <laughs> that's all you did? She's like, that's all I did. Yeah. And so then I came in and I went and just like got really deep into the world of marketing and direct response marketing and lead generation and then, you know, farming and all sorts of other things back in, um, not much has really changed since 2004 when I got in, in some ways. Yeah. It's, I always say that the principles are always the same. The strategies may change, but the, the core principles of the fundamentals are always going to be there. It's just figuring out what are you going to do and how you're going to apply those together. But the, the fundamentals of real estate has, has not changed yeah. much. No, it's, it's, it's always the same. I mean, it's, it goes back to someone said it the other day, but they, they didn't use these words, but I was always taught real estate's a contact sport. Yep. So even in the context of like growing a farm, Yep. You're building relationships and you're trying to do it at scale. And I know your listeners obviously know that because they've listened to you before, but it's like, I mean, I remember reading, did you ever read any books by Dan Kennedy? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. So like Dan Kennedy, and even though that's more like direct response where you're typically taking these cold traffic, the same concepts apply to working in your farm and yep. trying to spark someone's awareness and attention and figure out a way to build a relationship with them. Yep. That's the fundamentals of what it is. And I teach this all the time. And my listeners know that I talk about the CPR. It's something I've developed is the community positioning and relationships. And it's that community comes first with your farm. You position yourself as the expert and the ambassador, and then you learn to build the relationships and anything outside of that, not saying it doesn't work, but it's not going to work as well when you learn to have that come together. And there's so many strategies and different things that people are trying to sell you services and ideas and things like that. But then if you look at it, through that lens. And I always say, is it helping you with the community? Is it helping you connect with the community? Is it positioning you as the expert and the ambassador? And is it helping further and build new relationships? If it's not, it may not be the best thing to layer in or, and it could work, but yeah, you have to start with that fundamentals and then you can see what works and start building in things on top of that. I love it. I don't know if I've heard you say that before. I better, I better start listening. I probably have heard you say, I got to play, I got to pay more attention. <laughs> it's a good, ac- I love acronyms. It's a really good acronym though, CBR. Yeah, it's, it's, it's important, I think, to, to have that when you have that foundation and know what those fundamentals of real estate are, then you can start experimenting. And like you said, adding in direct response marketing and learning those marketing fundamentals, applying it to relationships is, is super important. So for you, what did you guys do when you were getting started to, to take that? Because obviously you said your mom had a different approach and you had a different approach and you, you merged together. So what did that look like for you? Yeah. So, so when we started, given that her background came from working for a company that was all about online lead generation at the beginning of the internet, we got really into generating online leads ourselves. So right. there wasn't even that many providers of online leads back then. And this is, I mean, there, people were definitely farming. People were definitely yeah. door knocking. I mean, there was the traditional way, but we were yeah. like, Ooh, what if we just buy a bunch of leads at scale? And jet, well, we were, you know, we weren't buying, we were doing ads in the back of the newspaper and full, like this is, I went to a, a coaching program. I'm sure it still exists. Do you, do you know Craig Proctor? Yep. He's from where, just up where, we, where I live. So he's about an hour. Outside where... Well, all, all Canadians know each other, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. They're all friends. No. Yeah. Okay. So, yeah, but so, so like, but I went to his, his event in 2004, I went yep. to the Craig Proctor super conference and I'm pretty sure his stuff is probably unchanged since 2004. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah. No, I'm not knocking Craig. I'm sure. Nope. But anyway, but like nothing has changed. And so we learned that stuff. And then once we built this book of business, then we kind of went backwards and got into the creating a farm, building relationships and developing deeper with these people. We've always, we've, you know, the purchase leads, we kind of went backwards and reverse engineered it because we had some money to spend. Like they had had a previous business. Yep. We had some capital coming into it. It wasn't like if I were to start as a brand new agent with no budget and I have to build from scratch, it was nice because we took that running head start. For the viewers who don't know direct response marketing is, why don't you explain? Because it's something I'm passionate yeah. about and it's something I'm key on, but why don't you explain to the viewers if they have never heard of it or have never done it? Yeah, absolutely. So, so most traditional advertising for the history of our country was image-based advertising, brand awareness. The most common form of advertising people know is like, if you think about Coca-Cola, you probably have an image in your mind that shows up. If I think about Nike, you can picture the emblem. And these are because these companies have spent hundreds of millions, if not billions of dollars at this point, cementing that image in your mind. That is by far the most expensive type of advertising out there. 
prior to the internet, now with the advent of the internet and YouTube pre-roll ads and weird things like that, you can do some image-based advertising yep. at a fraction of the cost of what it used to be. But direct response marketing is what came on the opposite end of the spectrum. Or instead of talking about you and your image and why you're number one in your marketplace, right? You've seen the old ad of like a realtor sitting on top of a roof and he's like, I'm above the crowd or whatever. I don't yeah. know what they, whatever <laughs> yeah. they, they, they talk about. And so um, you have on the opposite side, direct response speaks directly to what is important to the consumer. Yeah. And typically they're things that are going to either educate or give them like part of the response they have like these, hey, you're thinking of selling your house? What are the top three mistakes that sellers make when preparing their home for sale? That would be a very like classic direct response style ad, but it doesn't have to be like necessarily get a free report. It's just things yeah. that speak directly to the consumer. Exactly. And it's, yeah, I would say it's getting them to put their hand up rather than you putting your hand up saying, pick me, you're getting them to put their hand up so you can communicate. And it's, it's a key part of really understanding farming too. And I, when I, so I started on a team myself and we were a big Craig Proctor team. We use the systems and tools and that's where I learned. And that's what got me into farming in the very beginning, because I saw the direct response mark and I saw the opportunities. And then I thought, Hey, why don't we take it a step further and go direct response to a, a farm, to a neighborhood, to a community, rather than trying to reach everybody. I said, why don't and I kind of narrow this down to a more direct or a more targeted audience. And then I was starting to get even better responses. And if you do it correctly, the right approach, the right message, the right ad, the right type of marketing can get lots of people to put their hands up and really reach people who are motivated. Instead of waiting for someone to see your name over and over and over and over again, you're going to find the people who are looking to make a move a lot sooner and yeah. a lot easier. A hundred percent. So I'll give an example of someone that this is not what I do, but I, one of the guys I've had, he's a business partner of mine and he's been on our podcast a bunch. I don't know if I introduced him to you to be on your podcast yet, but he'd be a really good guest. His name is Dave Robles. He's out of Los Angeles, okay. uh, company Think Realty with, with EXP also. And uh, Dave, what he does, he has about 13 agents on his team in Los Angeles and he's broken them all down into hyper local niches. And he will then create a hyper-local farm with that agent partnering with him in those little niches. And they were crushing over the summer. They were doing seller webinars and buyer mm. seminars, but to a hyper-local farm. Mm. So doing this niche where they, they get really local, they make it specific to that local neighborhood, but then it's a webinar for sellers in that are getting them to raise their hand. It's yep. straight up, you know, direct response style. It was a really interesting, I, got, I think I got a couple of podcast episodes if people look awesome. up Dave Robles on Agent Power Hub, it, and, but really you could unpack them. I'll have to watch it. Them. Yeah, for sure. And I'll no, have no, have them on... just, just have them on your show. Yeah, you for sure. Him, Cause you, you'll approach it a different way than when I was listening to him, you'll probably come to it from a different expertise in farming and what he's doing. It's really smart. Yeah. Uh, and I think it's important for agents to understand with direct response marketing, it takes some time to, and I'm sure you've seen it. It's, it, it's not a, there's a one size fits all button and it's not something you just go out there and it works. So you got to test and track and tweak and you can have, res, res, you can have responses, but it's, you have to learn to really dive in. And I find a lot of agents are afraid of that. And I think they're afraid of losing money. They're afraid of doing the wrong thing. And then I find they don't start it and they know they probably should, and they know it might work, but they don't want to go out there. They don't want to spend the time to learn the nuances. So for you, when you were doing it, what did you do that was like working right out of the gate or like that was that actually started to get the res responses or what have you seen has, has been working? Yeah, so so on the listing side, right? Because always people always want yeah. listings, right? So so inside a inside of funnel inside a farm, the modern version of direct response marketing, I feel like people use the word funnel almost interchangeably with what we used to call direct response marketing. Yeah. And the most common seller direct response ad or uh, funnel that's existed for sellers that has literally not changed since two thousand three <laughs> is what's my home worth, yeah. right? Yeah. Zillow, a billion, however many billion dollar companies Zillow is worth, literally built their entire platform based on that one question of what is my homework? Yep. I mean, and, and that's really, so we started out, there used to be a company, oh gosh, they probably exist too, but I, I'm not, I'm in no way endorsing this company. I've not purchased leads <laughs> from them in over, I don't know, it's got to be 10, 12 years since I've actually bought leads from them, but it was called House Value or HouseValues.com. Okay. Do, do you remember that company? The name's not from, I never used them, but I, I recognize okay. the name, but... The, they, they were just one of the first people that were like, we by the way, it's funny because we've bought leads from almost anyone that will sell us a lead. Like if they'll sell you a lead, we've tested it out and tried it. And for a while we got a great return, but you pick a zip code, right? Much like a modern farm. And they would just do that front end of direct response marketing, where now you can do the ads yourself on Facebook or leverage a couple of platforms. We could talk about that, do the, the ads for you yep. and start finding people in a certain geographic area that are looking for what their home is worth to be the beginning of your farm within a farm. 
right? Yep. They're raising their hand. You're going to incubate and drip on those people and build relationships. Yep. So I used to check this out. I'm sure this still works today, but with COVID, I don't know. Take, take a pick. <laughs> but we used to get it. Someone would come in and say, what's my home worth? I was 24 years old at the time. I had nothing but free time and no kids, no nothing, right? And so we would print off a little market evaluation package. I'd put it in a gift box, like the type you get for like a dress shirt in. Yep. I put a bow, I put a bow on the top and I'd go drive over to their house and get, you know, 10, 12 a week. I go drive over the house, knock, knock, knock on the door. If they weren't there, I would leave this little gift box at their front door. Nice. Otherwise, if they were there, I'd have a conversation. And that was the first way that I think if I still had the bandwidth, it's hard to scale that, right? You yes. get runners and things like that. But this is this was based on my own sweat equity to go do this. I became really good at building relationships with people at their doors. Yeah. But but instead of knock, knock, knock on everyone in the farm and door knocking, I would only go to the ones that raised their hand and said they were curious about what their home is worth because yep. I knew they had a much higher statistical chance of selling in the next couple of years since they clicked on what their home was worth. Yeah, exactly. And that's that's how we built our farm as we did direct response marketing. We did door knocking, cold calling, and some postcards, but most of it was door knocking and, and cold calling. And we were offered a neighbor at a home prices report. So it was a, a guide, a monthly guide. And same thing, we drop it off each month. And it was that door, the relationship at the door is where we really made the difference. It wasn't just the ad that wasn't that first introduction. It wasn't that first website. It was the ongoing relationship, the dropping it off, talking to people. We ended up having our farm was about 3,600 people and we got 450 people on our report each month. So then we were dropping these off each month and, and connecting and building relationships. And that is where the value is. And that's what I want to talk to you today about is taking it to the next level. Cause a lot of people can, it's it, no offense to anyone watching this, but it's easy to generate leads. It's it's, you can buy leads. You can get them easy. That's so leads themselves are abundant. It's the converting the leads and how do you build relationships? And that's kind of where you specialize in is really taking it to the next level and, and getting a higher conversion. So what for you, let's start with the fundamentals of, of converting those leads. Like what's the, what do you think is the kind of key principles that people need to know? The number one thing that agents, and I've been the trainer for many, many years, the number one thing that agents screw up, ready? Write this down if you're listening, unless you're driving, in which case yeah. pull over. No, right, ready, write this down. <laughs> the number one way that agents screw it up is they don't listen. Mm. It seems really obvious when I say it. You're like, nah, is that really it? I'm telling you, their brain, your brain, whoever's listening to this, their brain is going on. What do I say next? Yeah. How am I looking? What's this going to say? And yeah. you're not present to the conversation. If yeah. you can develop that skill, if there's no other skills you have, if you just know how to be present to the conversation, yeah. you will start to learn to see the opportunities and where to take the conversation to go someplace that turns into business. And if it's not business, at least it's going to be beneficial to, to them, which ends up turning the business down the road for referrals yeah. and wherever later. Yeah. Just, but you can't be a helpful person if you don't know what's helpful to someone. Exactly. And that's, that's my problem with those traditional scripts where you just bang out the script, bang out the script, bang out the script. And I have a I think it's a funny story, but when I first got started, I had a newer an agent, a seasoned agent took me out and he was trained by, I won't say the names of it, but an old school trainer of, of whatever. And he took me out door knocking and he started doing a script. And the guy said, uh, you can take me out of here when I'm dead. And, and his next response was, that's fantastic. And the guy said, excuse me, did you just hear what I said? Like, I'm, you're not taking me out of here till I'm dead. And he was offended. And like, just that if you just listen to what he actually said and, and learn to respond, you don't say that's fantastic. <laughs> but, but did, did he listen? Like, did, was, did no. he actually think it was fantastic? No, he was not listening. He just, he was just going to the next thing. So I think that's tr <laughs> very true. What you're saying is that it's that just listening instead of waiting for the next rebuttal or waiting for the next thing. It's just that hearing what they say and, and learning to respond appropriately can make a difference. I'm, I, that is a really funny story. I'm going to start using that response when things don't make any sense at all. <laughs> <laughs> That's fantastic. <laughs> Did you hear what I said? No, yeah. no, I don't listen. I choose, I choose not to listen. Yeah. I, um, yeah, but one thing that, that there's a, a, without going too deep into like a training on effective listening, but if people Google effective listening versus authentic listening, mm. there's two different terms that are used in various places. Um, I believe that in this day and age, most people, the average consumer, absolutely, whether they have consciously know what sales techniques are, they yep. feel it at an intuitive level and they push them away. We yeah. are, we've gone past the place where like sales tricks work, yeah. right? You either have to do them so subtly that no one knows or genuinely <laughs> just be a good authentic person and come from a place that's like, you know, you want the best for them, which is far easier for most people to do. And yep. if you focus on what's important to them, not your own agenda, that just puts you in alignment. But here's, here's six, um, 
I'll give just not, I won't do all six because that's a whole like separate training, but I'll give you a couple of the elements of effective listening. Awesome. And again, research effective, research authentic listening. Um, one of the biggest thing would be staying in context, right? When someone asks you, when someone says something, you're going mm. to respond related to what they said in the next logical place. That's why you get those canned scripts you just said don't work so well. Yeah. So I've memorized all those scripts. I use those scripts. I just don't use them. Boom, boom, boom. Yeah. I stay in context with the next question. And eventually I know where I'm going because yeah. I've internalized them so much. I know how to get there. But it's like, if you tell me you're, you're not leaving the house until you're dead, right? My so a response in context would be like, it's awesome. You must, you must really love it here. Yeah, or like, exactly. do you plan to live a long time? <laughs> or are, is there something I should know about that? Is your health okay? Like there's all yeah. sorts of ways you can go depending on the vibe he's giving you, but those, all those responses are in context based on yeah. someone saying, I'm not leaving until I'm dead. Yeah. Yeah. Right? That's, that's crucial because yeah. that's, they're going to know that you listen, they were heard. And that's really what people want. They want to know they were yeah. heard and, and understood. And if you're just banging out a script and not in context, then they'll, they'll yeah. pick up on that. Yeah. There, there never will be an appropriate response to when someone says, no, I'm not leaving until I'm dead. The response should never be, I can arrange that. That's, that's the wrong. <laughs> yeah. That's yeah. the wrong. Yeah. I just want to make a note. <laughs> so, so that's one is, is, effect, is staying in context. The other thing is, this is the biggest one that most people have a hard time with. And tell me if you find this one too. It's listen, don't relate. Mm. Listen, don't relate. And so most sales trainers will tell you, and just human beings, it's like the way you bond with someone is to share an interest with them, right? Like you told me before we started recording, you had what, snowmageddon today, Yeah. right? Snowmageddon. And if I've ever been in this situation where I was in snow, I might think it's building reported like, you had a bunch of snow today? We had a bunch of snow last week. It was so snowy here, man. I remember this one time we got snowed in and that doesn't actually build any rapport, Yeah. right? If you remember what I said though, when you said you had snow again, and what, what did I say? So like it was crazy. How much snow, how much did you get? Yeah, started asking you questions. Yeah, as that's that's part of like I'm listening. I'm not relating. It might have I been in a, in a snowstorm. I mean, I live in San Diego. I, I was 21 before <laughs> I found falling snow, but I, like, but, but I do. I have experience of snow. But what gets me in rapport is that shared energetic space of yeah. me being interested in what you're saying. Yeah. You're walking around a house. Someone's got a bunch of ski resort pictures, and you don't say you love skiing. I love skiing. Yeah. No, you say you love skiing. Where do you ski? What's going yeah. on? You like. Tell, like it's that shared energy that you're excited about what they're interested in. Those two things, if you go to a dinner party, not that you know during the time of COVID we have any dinner parties, but <laughs> next time you're in a social gathering, Ryan, you listen for everyone who's doing this relating thing where they're trying to one-up each other. It is yeah. hilarious. Do you have any experience with that? Yeah, it's it's funny because because you said dinner party and I always think about like at weddings, when I'm at weddings, I always pick someone and I'll connect with someone at the table that I'm at or whatever. And then it ends up, I just ask them questions about their job, about their work. And at the end, they're like, oh, he's so awesome. It's like, I was just interested about their job. And like, I had a guy who was at a Christmas party and he worked at a drywall factory and he was telling me about the drywall. I'm like, there's so, I was just engaged with what do I do, what's the process, whatever. And at the end he told his wife, he's like, he was such a great guy. I'm like, I was just asking because I was actually interested but I could have sat there and said, well, I know someone who works at a drywall factory, this kind of factory. So yeah, it's, it is actually asking them the questions and, and engaging with not relating. It's yeah. the, yeah, the question helps. That's, that's, and, and that's that what you just told that story. I hope people remember that story of you at the wedding, because you say almost nothing about yourself. And yet this person goes, I really like this guy. Yeah. This is how, especially in a farm, I mean, with any client, where they where they come from, but especially in a farm, because so often you're, you're engaging with clients early on in their decision-making life cycle. Yeah. They're not interviewing agents right now. Yep. And even if they are, it still helps to ask them questions this way <laughs> and to build rapport, but like they, they truly aren't. And so if you, if you have this agenda of like, I'm going to go into my farm and I'm going to find people who are selling. No, you go, I'm going to go make friends. I, I'm actually, I, I'm writing a book right now that this is, this is a separate book that I, I had shelved because I realized you can only do so many projects at once. <laughs> yeah. Right. I, so I, I hear have, you on have, that one. I'm yeah, not, have, I'm not trying to relate. I'm, I'm actually can understand. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, you can relate on that one. That's fine. Yeah. <laughs> I think everyone, every, every agent and every person in the industry can feel that pain. Yeah. So I have one book that we're writing now called the, uh, the cardinal sins of text DMS and email. So that yeah. one's actually going to be out sometime in 2022 is depending on when we can finish it up. But the, the book that's been on my list forever, I literally have an outline written, I would love to finish it up someday. I have training videos on it, but it's called friend working. Mm. So stop networking and start friend working. Yeah. This, this is what I used to do when I had a lot of corporate clients. The same thing works in a farm. I, I go out and I consciously think I'm going to go make friends with these people. Yeah. 
not can I go find my next listing? Yep. It's how can I just, and, and when you come from that approach, it really changes the energy and the way people that, and they'll open up to you and they will tell you when they're moving. Yeah, absolutely. And that's, I think a lot of agents go to the transaction and focus on the transaction side of things and not the relationship side of things. And you're going to get way more tr- transactions from the relationships than relationships from the transactions. And if you go in there just being relationship based, you can absolutely take it to the next level. It's, it's, but it, it, it takes work. And I think it's also some agents maybe not be bred that way or, or have the time or the energy to, to want to do that. But yeah, I, I think that's, that's a great friend working is a great, great word for that. Thank you. I, I, I think, I think my friend Sarah came up with it. We were at a, at a real estate conference and I was describing the idea of this. We're trying to come up with a cool word for the book. And I think she's the one who named friend working. So I don't take credit for it, but I, but I am running with it. I, li- I love friend working. So, so here's, here's one thing that um, I do want to point out that you just said, some people may not be cut out that way or just, or wired that way. There are so many ways to make money in real estate. You yep. want to do the ones that gravitate to your natural personality yep. style. 100%. Most people listening to your podcast, I can only imagine they are naturally drawn to be relationship oriented, which is why they're listening to your podcast. I sure hope. Yep. But like me, I, I'm, you know, the disc test, right? Yep. Okay. So DISC, in case your listeners don't know it, there's four personality types. It does not define who you are as a person. You can transcend your disc test, but it is a leading indicator. Oftentimes like you show up this way in the world, Yep. right? D is the driver, the dominant, decisive. I is the interpersonal, the social butterfly, the connector. S is the support of the deep, meaningful relationships. And C is the engineer that drives you nuts when you take a listing with a C. No, I'm kidding. C is the, <laughs> the, de- the detail oriented, right? That everything's in the right place. So I am an off the chart I and an off the chart D, right? I have a D and an I. I don't naturally gravitate to making deep, meaningful relationships with people, mm. which is interesting because. I somehow wired myself this way because like you said, the person at the wedding, I love meeting people and learning their stories so much that it just naturally suits myself to developing relationships yep. because I'm genuinely curious to learn about them. Yep. Whereas if you are a high D listening to this podcast, hopefully, <laughs> yeah. you have, hopefully you have someone on your team that's going to execute and implement this because all you want to do is churn out the money, send some ads, go <laughs> exactly. take listings, kick button, take names. You need someone in your world to nurture and love on these people to create relationships because it ain't going to be you. Yep. And if you're an S, you're, that's how you're wired. Like, yeah. do, do you agree with that analysis that people who hundred percent button farms? Okay. Yeah. And it's, and I think, like you said, you have to develop it to the skills or talents that you have or, or what you want out of it. And it's either, if it's not going to be you, then you can put someone in place or systems in place or things in place to, to pick up the slack on the things you don't want to do or, or aren't comfortable doing. And, but that that's a great assessment. And I find the other one, which was the C, which a lot of people get hung up on that because a lot of C's kind of get pushed off to the side in real estate. They take time. Once they figure out a system, they can, they can do well, but they got to really polish that system perfectly. The S's I find in in farms do really well because it is relationship based. And especially if they, if they focus on a small scale, I find the S's do better on small scale farms than trying to be 5,000 home farms. If they do like a 500 and they can build the relationships, the I's like the 500 or 5,000 homes. Cause it's just a, get out, get out, get out, get out, meet people. And the, the D's just like, just, I don't know, just get out. They just want to mail out postcards and, and totally. get the rest of the thing. So yeah. Totally. It's We've done some interesting events that this is where like in our farm, which is I think part of the, um, part of the personality type that comes into this is knowing that if it's not your personality type, you can do some structural things like holding events or doing certain things that will complement your natural personality type. Yep. So we did one that was like a shredding event, which yep. actually I got also from Dave Robles, but I know a lot of people yes. do that in their farm, low cost, huge turnout. Yep. I mean, at this point, I don't know in COVID if it's, you know, if you get more bang or less bang, but we did it right at the beginning of COVID. So we, we gave out little bottles of our team is live, love San Diego homes. So we gave up nice. live, love San Diego homes, hand sanitizer, right? Yep. We had everybody's all messed up. We just had like 60, 70 people show up from our farm to go every 15 minutes. We had appointments and they scheduled and it's just drop off stuff to do, right? A shredding event, come, come yep. bring a couple of boxes or bring a truckload of stuff to shred. We didn't care. And then we just, then you keep in touch with them afterwards. So it's not direct response in terms of like, hey, you're thinking of selling, but it's yep. like, hey, direct response at the top of like, we'd like to engage in a relationship with you. Here's this free thing of value. Oh, you like this? Cool. Now I have permission to, I've met you. We've talked, we can drip. And I hate the word drip. Nurture, we can nurture the relationship. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. And that's part of why I talk about, I teach the scope method, which is having a balance your business. I think we talked about it before. It's self-promotion 
uh, community online prospecting education. And you have to make sure you've got more of a balance in your business because there are different personality types, not just real estate agents themselves that have different personality types. The humans that are you're farming to have different things. You're going to have D's, I's, S's, and C's in your farm. Yep. So by reaching them in different ways, you're going to connect with people in different ways. And I think that's a key to really getting more out of your farm and getting more relationships is ensuring that you're reaching people in the same way. If, if you're doing just postcards or just door knocking, or if you're just sending out flyers, whatever, you're only going to, only going to connect with a fraction of the people in your farm yeah. that you could. So it's you have to make sure you're yeah. reaching people in different ways. F fully agree. Unless you're doing YouTube pre-roll videos and you're heavily targeting cat videos, I think that's a <laughs> market niche. That yeah. If people don't know what YouTube pre-roll ads are, by the way, that's the uh, the ads that roll before you watch a video, which I think are an incredible tool in a, in a geographic farm. Do, do, you, do you teach much on that? I don't. It's something I is important. I haven't got into it myself, but I know it's definitely a thing. It's harder to target now than it used to be, I know, but I think it's important. Yeah. But it, it's definitely something that's really valuable. It's just interesting because I, I mean, we don't do it in our own farm because I've heard, learned this from a few other people that I've kind of launched onto this, which is why you don't need to do this. You can run a very profitable farm without ever touching any online ads. Yep. But because we talked at the beginning, you know, the cost of image-based advertising has come so far down. Yep. If you're going to have anyone in your farm touch your website, you should be pixeling them and retargeting yep. them. The yep. content you you hit them with, right? That could be anything, but that's a very, very low cost, top, top of mind yep. awareness. The same thing now with these YouTube pre-roll videos that I have barely seen any realtors using them. And yeah. you can't target exactly like the, the, just the, G, the farm, but there's ways that you can get pretty close because it's so cheap. If you have some spillover, it doesn't matter. Yeah. Yeah. But but let's let's pick the name of a farm. Let's say you're in like, I don't know, Stone Ridge Estates. I just made it up. Stone Ridge Estates, right? <laughs> you, could, you could literally make a video holding your, your, your phone at the end of your arm, no budget at all. Tap, tap, tap on the glass and say, hey, you live in Stone Ridge Estates? Yeah, hey. And then just start talking directly to them. And it's something yeah. that you couldn't have done in any medium prior, yeah. which is pretty darn cool. And if you did, it would have cost you massive dollars to be on TV or anything like yeah. that to, to have those kind of things rolling, yeah. which is exactly. yeah. huge. So yeah. I want to take then past the communication part because you said it's important to communicate. How do you add value? Because I find for a lot of agents, that's where they struggle. They they know real estate. They know they've got an audience. They know how to build relationships. I find a lot of agents struggle with going, okay, how do I consistently add value to my farm? They know they should. What have you seen has been working for agents to, to add value? Yeah so, yeah. so using your scope method, I think community is a huge one yeah. because I don't think people are thinking real estate all the time. And if you're always coming to them with recommendations on paint color and what to do to fix up their house and some of those traditional things, there's a little bit of that is okay. Yep. People will tune you out. They're not thinking that. They're thinking, I want to do business with people I know, like, and trust. Yep. And so show up in their world and the things that matter to them. If you have, like, you and I have kids, right? So if, if you have kids, then relate on the level of, like, you're going to be involved in kids and doing things around kids so that you can, or community events. One of my uh, one of my friends does a, a book drive where he will go around and drop off a little flyer that says, hey, we're going to uh, do a collection for, uh, for books. We're going to be back in next week. Leave any books you don't want outside. And so he's civic minded community where he's bringing people together. It's all these sort of things that are, those things add value to people's life. Yeah. Probably as much, if not more so than saying, Hey, do you know what your homes were? Yeah, exactly. Your house has gone up $3,000 in value, right? Like, and there's a time and a place for that in their funnel, but this is where it goes back to asking what's important to them and listening. Yeah. Um, as you do community events and you actually get to know the people in your farm and the people you're, you're, you're kind of your the people that rise to the top you engage with more i'm always looking for ways i can specifically um add value and like if, if i know someone is a business owner in this industry i see an interview of something and send it over hey did you see this cool yeah. thing that sort of way to connect as well does that make sense yeah absolutely and that comes down to those relationships and when you have those strong relationships and you know those people it's easier in my opinion to add value to those people individually instead of just trying to blanket meant message things like when you know yeah. someone likes certain things if there's a person who you've been speaking with who loves gardening and you can share an article about gardening or yeah. a good good friend of mine and uh is one of my first guests on the show matt santic apathy was talking about really segmenting your database and using tags and and really learning to add information into your database so that you can break them down so like he said if, okay if i know certain people love beer i can have 
a tag in there for, for beer lovers. And then now when I see a great article about beer or there's a promotion going on, cause he focuses on local business and things like that. Yep. He can then now segment his, his, his database to the people who are like that. If you love cats and you know, people are cat lovers, you can then say, Hey, there's a cat adoption clinic going on this weekend and you can really customize it. And then it feels even more personal. It feels more relatable. And then that I think really helps take it to the next level. A hundred percent. So my brain is wired that I remember those things. <laughs> I just, I do. I don't know why, but I, I'm really lucky that I have a very good memory for yep. non-essential facts. <laughs> I cannot tell you, I cannot tell you anything truly important, but I can tell you that I had a client 12 years ago who really liked Heineken and he liked the Pittsburgh Steelers. Like, I don't know why I know these details yep. of how it, but that's what sticks in my head. And so I do take notes in my CRM. I've never thought to use tags, which is kind of cool, especially of different like categories you can chunk them into. But even if I would write it down in my CRM, I would just remember those things. Yeah. Like it's, and I think if you, if you don't remember them naturally having a system. So yeah. do, do you know the book getting things done by yep. David Allen? Okay. Yep. So in case some of your listeners have read, never read this, this is one of the best books for productivity I've ever read. I know you're going to ask me about a book at some point. This is not my one book. This is my bonus book, right? Yeah. Okay. So Getting Things Done, GTD by David Allen. He talks about the concept of an external brain. So your brain is good for doing certain things. In my case, my brain is good for remembering those random facts, right? So it's how my brain is wired. Everyone's brain is good for certain things, higher level functions. The things that your brain is not good at or you shouldn't use your brain for, leverage an external brain like a CRM. In the old mm. days, it was like a Rolodex to remember those things or to remind you when to follow up with someone, yeah, right? That's something that a CRM is really good for because your brain's job is not to think about it. your brain is your brain is good for making connections, making friends. Be it, like that's does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and that's yeah. it. It takes some work to get those systems in place, but once they are in place, it becomes that much more easier. And then that's when things feel more natural on the other end to the to the consumer when it's like you didn't have to think about it and they got the call from you or the email or the the, the thank you card or whatever it is because you put the system in place and that's going to help take your business to the next level for sure a hundred percent there's one more little example that i'll give you one of the guys uh, matthew hanks i don't know if i talked to you about him for he's another good one for your, your podcast um he's got a really strong geographic farm they do a pie event every year yeah. where they offer three types of pie from some local, you know, well-known pie vendor and I have blueberry, apple, whatever, I forget the types of pie. And uh, um, they have people come to the office, which again, COVID in your area, I know some areas are like, you can't have people come to your office, fine, right? <laughs> Go drop it off to them, whatever, whatever yeah. way it is. But he has the reverse pop pie where people come to their office and he actually logs down which flavor of pie they want so that next year when he calls them, him and his team can say, hey, last year you got blueberry, want the same this year or something different. Like, what a cool little, yeah. like, in terms of creating that feeling in, in someone that you've done business with or just a friend, they're like, you've ever had a pie hat up? Yeah. Like, it's cool. And that's why I tell people all the time is that notes in your CRM is, is so important. And a lot of times people put like the basic, made a call today, blah, blah, blah. But take a note on what did you talk about? Who, what did they say? What was going on? Because that next call, we said, hey, you know, last week we talked about, or two months ago, we talked about your kids and whatever. Those little things are so impactful and so important. Again, especially when you're focusing on a, a tight knit community, they're going to start talking, saying, "Oh, I spoke with Ryan, and he remembered I like blueberry pie. He remembered that my kids were going to school. He, he asked about the movie I watched. And those things just doesn't take that much more work. It just right. takes work, but it, it will make all the difference. And and if you're going to do that, though, let's go one one step deeper. Right? I'm really into actionable things because if it's something specific, like, "Hey, they were sick two weeks ago, and you're going to follow up to see how they're feeling." Yep. That's already specific enough. But if you're going to say, hey, you know, how are the kids? There are certain things that in America or Canada or anywhere in the Western world, they're so generic that people ask about that they don't yep. actually feel specific. So if you're going to get down to kids, like if you're going to ask about kids, ask their kids' names, yep. right? So, so then you can you can say next time, like, hey, didn't you have a kid named, so I actually don't know your kid's name, never asked, but what, what's like, what, your, your ben. son, what, Ben, like, like how, how's Ben doing? Wasn't Ben had like a soccer tournament? Yeah. Like now it's like, whoa. And like, even if they, I mean, no one's ever going to ask, did you write that down in the CRM? But even if they ask, <laughs> exactly. you can say, you can say, no, of course I took notes on it because you're important to me. I want to remember, sure. but no one's going to ask. They're, they're going to be so blown away by the feeling you've created that, yeah. that someone actually cared enough about their life to stop and pause and ask them about it. Yeah. That's all they're going to remember. They're not going to question where it came from. And that's better than any image-based ad. That's better than any other type of marketing you can do. And those things are definitely will, will 
make a difference. And again, it, it helps you create the relationships, which is what the foundation is all about. And that's really the core of what the whole thing is. Yeah. I, I mean, I've heard you train enough that I know where your take on this is, but I think I'm not trying to talk people out of having 5,000 or 10,000 person farms, but the future of real estate is in hyper local. It's owning your relationships. It's hyper local. It's building a wall around people. And I think if you do a really good job at a hundred or 200 person farm, you're going to generate more business than someone with a 5,000 person farm and a big budget. Yeah. A hundred percent. I, one of my mantras in my book that I'm working on is, uh, is it's better to scale up than it is to scale back. And it's, I'd rather start with a small farm to really build those relationships, really figure out how to, to connect with people. And I've seen more people fail trying to go with 5,000 homes and try superficial things and try these old school methods that don't really work anymore. And then go, Oh man, it doesn't work. Or they, have to, they don't have the budget to keep it going. And I'd rather see you start with a few hundred people. I, I share a story of my friend, Adam, all the time. So he started his farm and I helped him pick out a farm when he was getting started. And there was 280 homes in his little pocket. It was this little area that they had a major highway come through and it like literally cut and sliced through this place. So it was like severed from the rest of the community and it didn't have a name. It was, it had a street that went through it. There was no named area. So he named it. He named it Driftwood Area Homes. He focused on this little area and he said, if I, I'm going to, if I can spend a hundred dollars a month, for a year, my wife won't kill me. And if I get something out of it, great. If I don't, then it was a hundred bucks a month and I'll be okay. He ended up getting eight out of the 11 sales in that little pocket. And it came down to those relationships because he knew everybody, he got to know everyone. He did a uh, neighborhood open invites early. He would do just stop by and, and door knock. And I said, I've seen people get more business from small areas than massive areas with massive budgets. So it's absolutely those, those smaller farms is where it's at. And those, those relationships are going to be super important in the future huge i'm gonna i'm gonna give one more doomsday scenario slash opportunity <laughs> before we wrap up this podcast sure. no, seriously because because this is where i've been been pounding from the top of the mountain for as long as i can up on the top but you know what i mean like i've been saying this for yeah. and it's finally coming true so if you don't own your relationships and you don't get hyper local the reason why it matters now more than ever because there are teams out there and there are agents that are crushing it with these giant farms and big ad budgets. I'm not saying it doesn't work today, yep. but you have these players coming into the space that are already here. You have yep. iBuyers, hedge funds, right? The company that rhymes with pillow. Um, <laughs> they have all these companies that have, and probably some players that we don't even know about that are hedge fund back that haven't even existed. That are these referral based portals that like, Hey, you want to find the best agent in town? And they're going to have TV ads and things like that. Yep. These are the people that are going to, to, to take over eyeballs that if you're just in an area and you're an agent who's been you know spending hundreds of thousands of dollars to market with them yeah you might be there but if you don't have a direct personal connection yeah. what's to stop someone from going to you versus this other entity that has even more money than you to spend yeah when you're local and you follow like this is why ryan if people are not you know sign up for your boot camp and taking their stuff truly like i like knowing that your boot camp which was rad like when, when you when you follow what the stuff that, that you're teaching, it ends up, you create these really deep, meaningful relationships and you do it at scale, but not huge at scale enough that to create a pretty major, major business. Yeah. That's future proofing your business in a way that there's nothing else I've seen out there that, that really can do yeah. that. And I think we can take back our industry if we did that again. And I think this is where I always talk about with real estate is we shifted from being that. We used to be the local connector. We used to 25, 30 years ago, we were the, the Rolodex for the community. People would call and say, hey, I need this. Who, who do you know for this? And then we went to on, <clears throat> online leads and we went too big, too broad. And then people lost that local connection. And I think if we come back to that and if we can get those roots back to being that, the, the, the who's who in the, in the local community you're serving, I think we can really reshape our, our communities and, and this business as a whole. A hundred percent. I never thought of that in that context, but I love it. <laughs> so, I do know. I love it, man. That's a perfect segue into our last piece of advice. So if you were giving some advice to our agents listening to this, thinking about how do I build further relationships? How do I add more value to the community? What advice would you give them? Work on your skill set of listening to develop connection. Do it in areas that are low barrier, low, like low threat. So you're not really attached to it. Play around with this and, and like go to Starbucks, work on building rapport with someone you've never met there, right? Go to a wedding and talk to the guy who works at a drywall factory. Yeah. Like places where, where it doesn't matter. Like if it goes bad, like guys, ah, if you're attached to how it's going to go, it's bad. And then the second piece of it, because I, I can't just give one piece of advice. So <laughs> yeah. number one is, is work on that skill set for connection. The second set is be consistent. Be consistent, truly with farming, with anything in real estate, 
like I can't tell you how many agents I've seen that have started doing something and given up right before they're about to have some pretty big success yeah. or started going and they didn't nearly go. It's just about staying consistent. Once you pick a path, yeah. you can always pivot, you know, move it, just pick a path, go yeah. for it. That's awesome. Great advice. And hopefully your yeah. viewers listen to that and take that to heart and go out and, and practice it. Uh, so we wrap up with our best book you knew was coming. So what's one book that you've loved that's made an impact in your life or you think would have an impact in our viewers life? So I'm going to give the book that I'm currently reading because it's first and foremost in my <laughs> mind, which is Good to Great. Mm. Have you ever read Good to Great? Yeah. Yep. Jim Collins. Collins. Yeah. 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 I can't. It's one of those books that I'd heard about so many times and I dismissed it because I thought the title was so like, yeah, I might never go from Good <laughs> to Great. I get like, I did. And then I started reading like, whoa, this book is awesome. So for anyone that's looking for any sort of leadership guidance, as well as how to structure your organization, because even if you're a solo agent listening to this, you still have people around you that are part of your organization. It really has something that's a little bit for everybody yep. um, that I think can apply, especially in the context of growing a farm and building yeah. with your organization. It's it's a fantastic book. Yeah, it's great. It's classic and, and definitely applicable at, at all sizes and scales of, of business to, to implement. So that's awesome. Yeah. So we'll put that in the show notes so viewers can check that out. So how can our viewers check out what you're up to, connect with you and find out more about what you're doing? Yeah, so if they go to uh, theagentcollective.com, that's actually our new... Uh, podcast network we just launched nice. and they can get details there for agent power huddle which is our daily podcast and a bunch of other shows shows you're a guest on ryan various okay. episodes they can go to the search bar and type in your name ryan smith okay. and probably see multiple episodes of various things um by the time this podcast episode comes out hopefully we will have ironed out the bugs this is the first time i'm publicly saying <laughs> it's already it's already live the agent collective.com but we're not sending nice. traffic there yet because we're still okay. tweaking it but uh we'll go check it out Awesome. We appreciate that. And that's great. We'll put that in the show notes as well. So yeah. appreciate they, being they on can, here. They can oh, hit right. me up on any social media platform. So if you want to talk to me personally, like my name, Jesse Zagorski, just and that's what I was going to say up. is you're super easy to connect with, easy to get a hold of your, your, uh, your wealth of knowledge you're willing to share. And I appreciate that about you. And you're an open book when it, when it comes to this business and the things, you know, and, and connecting people, which is awesome. So feel free to reach out to you directly. Cause I know okay. for audits should, should reach out to you if they want to. It's you got a great thing. The show's great. You've got a lot of great content on there and you're always coming up with awesome new things. So th thank sure. you for being on the show and, and sharing your wisdom with our audience. I know they're going to really appreciate it. Yeah. Thanks for doing what you do. See you around. Awesome. Thanks. Thanks for checking out today's episode. If you'd like more videos like this, be sure to like and subscribe to our YouTube channel. Check out our Facebook page and our other social media channels. Looking forward to bringing you more great content like this and happy farming. <laughs> <laughs>